want to introduce uh, Professor Jimmy Coleman, the Dean of the Faculty of, of Medicine and Health Sciences at Stellenbosch University. Uh, Professor Coleman, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks a million, George. Um, good morning, colleagues. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, stand up here for a few minutes. Uh, my main job uh, is to, to welcome uh, our rector and vice chancellor. But I just want to take the, uh, the opportunity to say how delighted we are uh, to be linking up the SENSCOM. Uh, as the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences through our Center for um, Evidence-Based Healthcare to jointly run this, uh, this meeting. Uh, it's the first time we, we're doing this. Hopefully it will not be the last, but uh, I think you as the audience will determine the value of, of, of these discussions over the next few days. So, before I call up Professor Wim de Villiers, our Rector and Vice-Chancellor, I just wanted to uh, say these few words of, of introduction about him. Uh, Wim is the 12th Rector and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Stellenbosch, and he was appointed on the 1st of December 2014. Uh, he finally took up his position in April 2015. I believe it was not on the 1st. Um, Wim matriculated at, uh, at Paul Ruiz in, in, uh, uh, in 1977 uh, and obtained his MDCHB at uh, Stellenbosch Cum Laude in 1983. Uh, at the time he also received the Francis von Sale and Chancellor's Medal uh, for Academic Achievement. In 1990, he, was, he obtained an MA degree um, in internal medicine at Stellenbosch, also Kulhan. Later, after receiving a Nuffield Medical Fellowship, uh, he went to Oxford, where he obtained a DPhil in immunology in 1995. And later, during his time in the US, he also uh, studied for a <coughs> master's degree in healthcare management at Harvard. Um, de Villiers, his wife Catherine and their children spent, uh, before coming back to South Africa, about 21 years, I believe, in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, where Wim practiced as a gastroenterologist and established himself as a respected researcher in the field. He held positions, various positions, at the University of Kentucky, including head of gastroenterology and administrative head of the Good Samaritan Hospital in Lexington. In July 2013, he returned to South Africa and was appointed as Dean of Health Sciences at the University of Cape Town. And as I've said, since April 2015, he has been at Stellenbosch as the new Rector and Vice-Chancellor. So that's all I have to say about our dear leader. Um, other than uh, the fact that as a fellow physician, I uh, have always held the view that gastroenterologists make the best leaders. If you think about it, these guys work in dark tunnels all day, <laughs> securing the knowledge that there will be light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> so they're all optimists, and optimists make the best leaders. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, good morning, colleagues, friends. What Jimmy forgot to say, as gastroenterologists, we also believe very fervently in a bottoms-up approach. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, good morning, folks. It's a real pleasure to, to, to welcome you here. So, on behalf of Stellenbosch University, welcome to this event. And I, I've been informed that this is actually the first ever summit in the world looking specifically at quackery and, and pseudoscience. And it is being hosted jointly by the Center for Evidence-Based Healthcare in our Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, as well as the Center for Science and Technology Mass Communication, which is attached to the School of Journalism in our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So it's a true interdisciplinary venture. 
And this is a, a clue why this makes this gathering so not only unique, but also very timely and powerful, because it brings together professionals from the medical sciences and media and law for a very in-depth focus on the dangers of quackery and to debunk some serious science pretending to be the real thing. So I want to thank you for your interest. I would like to single out especially just a few of our international speakers in session one. Uh, followed after this opening slot, we will have the award-winning journalist Tom Zeller. And in session one tomorrow morning, Michael Marshall of the Good Thinking Society in the UK. And joining us via Skype will be Simon Singh, award-winning author of, uh, amongst others, Trick or Treatment, Alternative Medicine on Trial. So thank you all for, for coming here uh, today. As Jimmy said, um, I'm a medical doctor and a physician, um, gastroenterologist, and I've for the longest time been very concerned about quackery and pseudoscience. I practiced in the United States for an extended period of time as a gastroenterologist, and with my formal title actually being a professor of digestive diseases and nutrition. And I had a very large uh, practice of patients suffering from inflammatory bowel disease. Now these are diseases uh, like, such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are long-standing, lifelong diseases involving chronic inflammation of the gut that over the time of my practice, we've made significant advances in medical therapies. But there are difficult diseases to get under control, which we can do with maintenance therapies. So some of the most frustrating times would be when, after I had struggled, or we had struggled quite a while to get these patients into remission, or to get their diseases under control, they would return to the clinic to be in a full flare, and you would ask them what had happened. And they said, no, they'd stopped the medication, which we had prescribed to them. And the reason for that is because of some of the other article that they'd read, or some other anecdote that they'd heard from um, somebody in their community, which would just be utter nonsense. It would be serious science would be based on on, on, on very poor information, and as a result of that, their health suffered significantly, resulting in either hospitalization or unnecessary surgery. So, this is actually very close to my heart, this topic, because what I've seen is that the practices of macro and pseudoscience, they not only misleading, they're exploitative, but also dangerous. So, a couple of examples. So, yes, the history is, is punctuated with conspiracy theories. So, the conspiracy theories around the moon landing, the Illuminati, UFOs, Elvis Presley, and the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And if you believe the current president of the United States, another conspiracy theory is climate change. But in the, in the medical scheme of, of things, just take the anti-vaccination campaign, which is really, which is wreaking havoc worldwide. From Wales to California, to Australia, and also right here in Stellenbosch. And just when we just thought we'd eradicated, almost eradicated measles, <coughs> is making a comeback. Because I think the contribution that the anti-vaccination campaign has and just look at AIDS denialism in our country and the devastating effects that it had on thousands of deaths in our country. So, as I said, this topic is, is close to, to, to my heart. In this day and age, it is really incomprehensible how anyone can spew nonsense, dangerous nonsense that would take us back to the dark ages. But the answer to it is, or the treatment in a sense, would consist of two parts. So first, healthcare decisions should always be based on the best 
scientific evidence available. And the approach of evidence-based healthcare teaches us, doctors and other healthcare providers, to how to separate good research from the bad and how our patients can take informed decisions based um, for, their, for their treatment. Informed decisions. And the touchstone is, that, is exactly what I said, it's evidence, scientific evidence. Because science does not work on conjecture, rumor, conspiracy theories, scaremongering. Science is able to produce reliable knowledge thanks to the scientific method. And as the Oxford English Dictionary quotes that, it's a procedure consisting of systematic observation, measurement and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. So that's this, the first component, and that's of evidence-based healthcare. The second component of the treatment to factory and pseudoscience is proper science communication, which is basically a bridge between the research, which is often technical and very complicated, and members of the public who need this information in an accessible and digestible form. And that's really what we at the university that we're very much involved in. We're a, a research intensive university that produces a large amount of research and knowledge, but you know, knowledge production is key. But it really all amounts to very little if that knowledge only gathers dust on library shelves or in languages in electronic databases. So the sharing of scientific output is, is just as vital as conducting ongoing research that's of the highest quality and also producing graduates with advanced qualifications. And then a number of ways in which we promote the sharing of research for popular consumption here at Stellenbosch University. Uh, we, and this is the importance of dialogue and the open nature of science. So the popular science author Steve Johnson said that breakthroughs are not about a solitary genius that is so much more brilliant than anybody else. No, ideas are fundamentally networks of other ideas. And we take the tools and the concepts and the scientific understanding of, of our time. And then we remix them, remix them into something new. But we can't do that unless the ideas are shared. It's only good that once these ideas, they should get into circulation, they need to converge with other ideas, and then they should be tested against the demand of relevance, and then open up the doors of, of possibility. But to do that, we need communication professionals in the field of, of science. And as we see here today and tomorrow, they need to be alert to the dangers of pseudoscience. I have a great example of this, and I'm going to plug a book from uh, the university that I was at before, University of Cape Town, that was written by Nicolae Natras on the AIDS conspiracy, Science Fights Back, a wonderful book that really describes the, that time in, in South African history of um, AIDS denialism. And, and specifically, there's a chapter in the book why, where she describes why these conspiracy theories uh, become so popular and why they really take hold. And she says there, a community, the community of AIDS denialists, and it can actually really be applied to many other conspiracy theories, quackery, pseudoscience, that the, the, um, such a community, or the AIDS denialist community, consists of, of four main categories. You know, so the first is, the hero scientist that adds a, some measure of credibility to the theory. The second is the cultural premier, the cultural premier, somebody making money from this. So, the example that she stated was Matthias Rapp, who offered alternative solutions to ARVs. The third, so it's the hero scientist. The cultural premier. Thirdly, is the living icon or living icons who provide the proof that either these alternative therapies are successful 
or that in the case of AIDS, that AIDS doesn't really exist anyway. <laughs> but you never hear about them after they've died. And the point is the praise singers, the praise singers who provide well-needed publicity to keep this going. So these four categories, I think, are naturally, uh, Natalie's really uh, uh, describes beautifully how this worked in the, in the AIDS denialist movement. But I think these, these four categories are very much present in, in many, if not all, of, of these uh, conspiracy theories or pseudoscience movements that we hear about. But in terms of communication professionals, I think in the parlance of our time, one should describe pseudoscience outright as fake news. Fake news being media content that actually looks like factual reporting but is merely propaganda aimed at swaying the public opinion one way or the other. And worsening the problem is the echo chamber effect in social media. If you only hear what you want to hear, because all that you're exposed to are views similar to your own. And the result is what we have, is, is the post-truth world that we find ourselves in. A situation where the facts don't matter as much as what you want to believe because it suits you. And this is bad news. Fake news is bad news. Pseudoscience is bad news. Quackery is bad news. And that is why this summit is such a welcome initiative. Uh, Provolmont said in a um, press release that the summit is an effort to push back against these exploitative practices whose pernicious impact is being amplified through the internet and the social media. And it's an extremely important topic. It's, it's of, of the utmost, utmost interest to, to those who, who really want to guard in, against these practices being, as I said, misleading, exploitative, and dangerous. And I really want to welcome you to two days of fruitful deliberation, and I would be very interested to participate. Thank you so much.